video games and swordplay go hand in hand. We've seen some incredible games going back from sort of the mid 80s up to present day. Uh, sort of getting started with relatively simple platform games with little more than just pressing one button to attack. Um, but then we jumped in in a matter of just a couple of years into two dimensional one-on-one um, -on -one fighting games uh, where we could move more freely. The introduction of um, parrying and displacement came in. And then almost at the same time we had the very first three-dimensional games which introduced um, new ways of moving, uh, more complicated ways of parrying and attacking, and the introduction of weights, different balances, um, and, and all kinds of things that made sort of those kind of games much more interesting and challenging to play. Now personally I think the 90s are the decade that sort of demonstrate the greatest change in games. Now of course in recent times we've got a, a dearth of three-dimensional games um, some great, some not so great. But if you go back to the 90s, you have the full array of different types of gameplay uh, on display. So I'm going to look at five games that I think sort of best demonstrate um, those different types of gameplay. Um, they're all games that I actually own. Uh, I'm only going to show you games that I actually physically have with me. Um, and all of the footage of the actual games will be coming from original hardware. So it'll be captured uh, and then shown on the screen so you can see exactly how it looks. Uh, let's get started. Golden Axe, the first game in the, the long-running Golden Axe hack and slash series. Uh, first came out actually in 1989, but the European release on the Sega Mega Drive actually came out in 1990, making it the oldest game uh, out of the games that I've chosen here. Now it's it's a fun uh, hack and slash, a sort of side-scrolling game. Um, you can throw people and you can hit people, all using the same button. Um, it has a very rudimentary control scheme though. You can see you know, most of the time jumping and hitting people as you fly through the air is the most effective way of playing the game. Uh, the only thing really I would say of note is that if you're attacked by multiple people um, you're at a great disadvantage which is quite realistic for anybody that's been involved in fencing. Um, you can control three different characters. Uh, there's a woman, a dwarf and a man and you can ride around on monsters fighting people as well. So it's good fun, there's lots of sequels to it, and it's available on all different platforms. Samurai Showdown 2, also known as um, Samurai Spirits 2, depending on which region you're in. Now this game was released on the Neo Geo, um, and for anybody that's not familiar with that system, it was a 16-bit um, home console that used the exact same hardware as the coin-operated arcade machines. So you could buy the game, uh, play it at home, and it will be identical to the one in the arcade. Not similar, but absolutely identical. Now this particular game, many believe is the, or many would argue, is the best Samurai Showdown game. Uh, that's quite contentious in the kind of Samurai Showdown circles, so I, I won't necessarily say that. But it is uh, an extremely well-made game. The, um, the graphics, if you compare it to other consoles of the era, if you look at, say, the Mega Drive, um, the sprites are much, much bigger, uh, they're very colourful, has a very detailed colour palette, uh, and it's a big game. You know, the cartridges that came for the Neo Geo were massive, and they could hold an awful lot of information. Now, this particular game has a roster of different characters, with uh, a variety of weapons. Now, being a, a samurai-based game initially, the emphasis is on Japanese weaponry. But, um, there is a character, as you can see here, that's using a rapier. Um, to deliver cuts and thrusts in, in much the same way as the other swords in the game. Now the actual weapons don't really tell us anything particularly useful in terms of historical weaponry, uh, but this game does have some interesting features that make it uh, quite interesting when it comes to fighting. It has a, a rudimentary parrying system, it's one of the um, first games to actually feature one, so rather than just jumping around and hacking and slashing and kicking and stabbing and, and the rest of it, you could actually parry, so somebody could attack, uh, you hit um, the button at the right time, you block, you block or deflect the attack, and then you get a moment of opportunity to strike back. Now this game also uses the usual sort of power-ups, and it has a, a life meter, so you know you can hit people multiple times. So not particularly realistic. You know you can hit somebody in the head with the rapier straight in the face, and it doesn't end the fight. Uh, but saying that, it's an awful lot of fun, uh, leaping around, um, throwing people through the air. Uh, very entertaining, and as I said on the Neo Geo, you get the perfect experience. So you buy the cartridge, it's the exact same game. So you can play it at home, and it'll be just like you're in the amusement arcades in the 90s. Uh, it's not particularly expensive as well, one of the cheapest Neo Geo games you can buy. The Last Blade 2 by SNK. 
This is a game for the Neo Geo system, and it's been ported to all kinds of uh, different consoles and home computer systems since. Now this game is an interesting one, in that it's pretty much the swan song of the, uh, the 2D uh, sort of bitmap, sort of sprite-based fighting games in the 90s. Now coming out in 1998, it's right at the end, and we've already got lots of different 3D fighting games coming out at this time. Now this game is a darker version than the original uh, game, just known as The Last Blade. Um, the big difference between the two, apart from the graphical style, which is much grimmer and darker, is the fact that the individual characters are no longer matched. So it, it's not like sort of one is faster but sort of let down by sort of reduced strength or power or something. They're all different, and depending on the way you like to play the game, you'll find some characters work an awful lot better. Um, this kind of mismatch is actually, I find, quite fun. Uh, it allows you to sort of take on a sort of a, a much tougher to use character and play through, or stick to one particular style that you really like. Now you'll notice in the game, it does still have a bit of jumping around like most fighting games have, uh, but it does have a variety of sword-based attacks, it has some close-range melee attacks, and best of all, it has a good parrying system. Um, now it doesn't have parrying at different angles or heights, but it does have, um, it is a timed based um, parry. So if an attack comes in, you parry at the right time, you can come in with a follow up, um, as you would with sort of a parry or a pass using um, conventional weapons when you're sparring. Now this game has beautiful um, hand drawn artwork, as opposed to sort of the photographic style that you come across in something like Mortal Kombat, where it's had sort of digitized sprites made. Uh, so if you look at this, every single image in this has loads of different things moving. You can see the horses in the background, sort of a cowboy moving. Uh, it's a really beautiful looking game, a lot of fun, and as a Neo Geo game, the home version is the same as the arcade version. Soul Calibur. Is there any surprise that Soul Calibur appears in the list of sort of great sword based games from the 90s? This is a series that's still going now. Um, and it's it's one of the most popular series that you'll find out there. Now this uh, particular version that you're watching now is my Dreamcast version of Soul Calibur. Uh, this one came out in December 1999, so one of the very last games to come out in the 90s. Uh, it's the second game in the Soul Calibur series, even though the name would suggest it's the first. And it's the sequel to Soul Edge, or I believe Soul Blade, depending on which region you're in. Uh, now this game it has a, a sort of a complex roster of characters with, as you can see here, we've got sword and buckler versus nunchucks, but there's long swords, curved blades, uh, and all kinds of weird and wonderful weapons. Now it has all the standard stuff of running around, jumping in the air, um, uh, complex combinations of moves, but there are also a few things that make this quite interesting in terms of swordplay. Um, you're able to move in eight directions. Uh, depending on where you move the joystick, so you've got full degree of movement around the battlefield. Um, it has a more complex system of parrying and deflection, um, so you can beat away attacks rather than just hammering away on the buttons to attack. Um, and and this sort of gives you um, a sort of a more complex, more interesting way of fighting in the game. Uh, but I think this actually makes it um, uh, quite a big improvement over similar games to it. And the other thing that they introduced over the previous game was what you might call a sort of a forgiving buffer uh, in terms of performing complicated manoeuvres. So if you delivered a cut and you wanted to do something else immediately afterwards, you could initiate the second movement before you finish the first, which for anybody that practices fencing will know we often, uh, well we should, we perform multiple techniques, uh, one after the other, and we might perform sort of a feint and then follow it up with a cut. So this particular game allows you to sort of queue up moves like that um, and it has enough of a buffer that you don't have to worry f about absolutely perfect timing. You can just spend a little bit more time actually getting the sequence working right. It's a great fun game, uh, definitely recommended. Bushido Blade by Lightweight. Now this is a 1997 PlayStation game and I think it's actually something pretty special. This is uh, quite a rarity in the kind of the dueling type games, in that it's not based around having um, sort of um, uh, sort of life meters or health bars. Uh, it's based purely on delivering a mortal blow to defeat your opponent. And you can see here one decent cut, and the fight is over. That's it. Now the other interesting thing about this game is it uh, is, is its use of weapons, and it's primarily Japanese weapons. But as you can see here, it also has a mixture of, of Western sort of European weapons. 
Now, the weights and the handling of the Japanese weapons are quite reasonable. The European ones are a little off. You know, the longsword is, is, is much smaller than you'd expect. The rapier is more like a spadroon, and the broadsword is like a big two-hander. But the kind of the weights and the speed and the and sort of the, the, the way you can use them for parrying is actually, you know, I think it's reasonably realistic. But what really stands out with this game is the sort of the mortal aspect of the fight. Now this particular mode is called the slash mode and it's one where you just have one fight after another. So it's one of the more static modes, um, but it is easy to see what happens. Now you can see that you can actually form up into different stances in this game. So you can flip between a sort of a high, middle and low stance and that will affect your ability to deliver cuts and parries. Um, it has a parrying system built in as well. Um, there are no ridiculously silly moves, you know, you can run a bit, um, and you can see you can do like a little roll there, but it doesn't have the kind of the craziness that you find in something like Soul Calibur. So it's, it's a very different game to what we're used to. Now the other big change is that there's no time limit, and you can move anywhere you like in the game. So you can spend an hour, if you like, running around, looking for the high ground, um, looking for cover or somewhere else to fight behind. And you can really go at it. So if you play this as a two-player game, it can be quite a tactical fighting game. Uh, and you can spend ages kind of working through trying to deliver the right cuts and techniques to defeat your opponent. Take out a leg and they drop down to one knee. If they lose one arm, they have to use a two-handed weapon with one hand. All in all, a really decent uh, dueling game. So there you have it. Those are the five games that I think are most representative of sort of the 90s era of sort of two-dimensional and three-dimensional fighting games but it's it's only a taste there are loads and loads and there's so many more games you know for producing this video this is just a small pile of the games that I decided to have a look at now out of those 10 games I managed to bring them down to five for this video and I think three of them stand out more than the rest um, first of all in terms of what I think is the most fun to play will be the first of the Soul, pa Soul Calibur games. Well, actually, technically the second Soul Calibur game, but the first Soul Calibur game actually called Soul Calibur. Now, this is the Dreamcast version. Um, I have other versions and other platforms, but I think this one plays best on the Dreamcast. It's fast. It's a lot of fun. It's, it's maybe not the most realistic example of fencing that you'll ever see, but you'll have a hell of a lot of fun playing it. Second is... Bushido Blade. Now this is the yeah this is the um, the European version, and uh, for the original PlayStation. Now, although technically I think it's probably the best game and one of the best sort of sword-based games that's ever really been made. And it's got the different technique, it's got the different guards. You can use the environment against your opponent. It's it's got everything in it. The only thing I would say is when you sit down, you want to play with your friends for sort of multiple hours in a fighting game. I think it gets a little dull quite quickly, um, but in terms of technique, it's exceptional. Uh, lastly, in terms of art and style, um, it would have to be a Neo Geo game, and this particular one is The Last Blade 2. Now, it may not be the best fighting game, and I think um, Soul Calibur is, more, is, is a much more entertaining game, and I think Bushido Blade is um, a more realistic sort of fighting game, but when it comes to the way something looks, I think you'd be hard pressed to find anything better than something like Last Blade 2. And for those of the for those of you that don't know, the cartridges really are as big as people say they are. They're this big. They are monstrous. Anyway, um, I hope you enjoyed that short video. I'll be putting out uh, more content on um, sort of sword-related um, fighting games in the future. Um, please comment on the video. Let me know what you agreed with, what you disagreed with. Um, and I'll, um, I'd love to produce some later videos and go into games in more detail.